We are in a revolution. But it is a revolution in which the side that fires the first shot loses. We will not fire any shots because our weapon is uncommon good sense. You are listening to the Tractor Time Podcast. We are proud to be sponsored by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are real farming equipment for real farmers and homesteaders. BCS is often mistaken for just a rototiller, but with gear-driven transmissions and dozens of professional quality implements, they truly make superior pieces of farming equipment. Engineered and built in Italy, where small farms are a way of life, BCS two-wheel tractors are built to standards of quality and durability expected of real agricultural equipment the kind of dependability every farm needs. With PTO-driven attachments like rototillers, flail mowers, rotary plows, power harrows, chippers, shredders, snow throwers, even a utility trailer and a high-pressure irrigation pump, BCS America can supply tools you need to get jobs done across the farm and the homestead. Even on large farms where a four-wheel tractor is a necessity, BCS two-wheel tractors can tackle jobs that simply can't be done with the larger machines from mowing steep slopes and along pond banks to working soil and high tunnels and hoop houses. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments and watch videos of BCS in action. Hello and welcome to Tractor Time. Brought to you by Acres USA, the voice of eco-agriculture. I'm your host, Ben Trollinger, and as always, I wanted to say thank you to our sponsors, BCS America. Today we're talking about wheat, ancient wheat. You've probably heard of Kamut, also known as Khorasan wheat, also known as King Tut's wheat. It's different from the commodity wheat that most of us are used to. It's drought resistant, it's highly nutritious, it's in organic breakfast cereals, it's in pasta, people with gluten issues can eat it. It's one of organics farming's biggest success stories. It's a story that's rooted deep in history, stretching back to ancient Mesopotamia, and it might just show us the way forward. I'm joined by Bob Quinn and Liz Carlisle, co-authors of Grain by Grain, a quest to revive ancient wheat, rural jobs, and healthy food. The book details Quinn's journey over the last several decades to turn his dryland farm in Big Sandy, Montana into a powerhouse of organic and regenerative agriculture. Through his multi-million dollar heirloom grain company, Kamut International, Quinn has managed to create a durable network of around 200 organic farmers. They're all growing Kamut. Quinn was also instrumental in shaping the country's first organic food standards back in the 90s, and before that, he helped establish standards for his home state. Also a Montana native, Liz Carlisle is a lecturer in the School of Earth, Energy, and Environmental Sciences at Stanford University. Her first book, Little Underground, prominently features Bob Quinn's work and also won the Montana Book Award and the Green Prize for Sustainable Literature. Uh, Welcome to both of you. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Thank you so much, Ben. Truly a pleasure. Liz, I'd like to start with you. How did you first hear of Bob Quinn? You're both Montana natives, correct? Both Montana natives, and um, I ended up working for U.S. Senator John Kester, who's an organic farmer from Montana who got elected to the U.S. Senate, and um, that was incredibly inspiring to me to hear somebody running on a platform about the green economy. Um, I heard about it while I was a country and western singer and really seeing how people were struggling in rural America trying to earn a decent livelihood being stewards of the land. So, so John's work really inspired me, and it wasn't, gosh, a week into my work in that office um, when a colleague first told me about Bob. And um, my interest was peaked from the beginning because here was this guy in a cowboy hat standing in front of this wind farm that he'd helped develop. And, you know, just patiently kind of planting the seeds of a really different kind of economy, not an extractive economy, which is our history in Montana, whether you look at, you know, mining or petroleum or even the the form of agriculture, which has been extractive in terms of nutrients, but really a regenerative economy and really putting all those pieces of the puzzle together so it would be possible for people um, to earn a decent livelihood farming regeneratively in Montana. And tell us a little bit about how he factored into your first book, Lentil Underground, and why you decided to sort of tell his story in greater detail in Grain by Grain. 
Yeah. So, so my first book um, was really about how farmers started integrating um, pulse crops, legumes, um, plants in the bean and pea family into their grain rotation so that instead of just having a monoculture of wheat, which then of course would re require chemical fertilizer and also chemical herbicides in order to protect that monoculture from invasions of wheat, Feeds, um, farmers started developing these more complex rotations. So lentils were kind of a, uh, you know, the poster child character of that book as one of these bean and pea crop families that allowed farmers to get out of that cycle of having to rely on the, the chemically based, fossil fuel based fertility. So I ran into Bob while I was researching that book because he'd been one of the first people to uh, really pioneer these more complex rotations. Um, but, but then, you know, I started to, um, the, the part of the story that I didn't tell in that book is that not only did farmers start rotating new things into their grain, but they started doing different things with the grain part of the rotation as well. And that's really, um, you know, Bob's really at the center of that story of thinking about planting different kinds of grains, um, that work better in organic rotations and also work better in our bodies than the modern wheat that we've bred. Well, Bob, tell us more about Kamut. What's its origin? Why is it unique? And how does it intertwine with your personal story? Well, actually, Kamut is, um, is a trademark that we've registered to sell in ancient grain. So it's not the name of the grain, but it's a trademark used to guarantee to the customers that <clears throat> this ancient grain that we're dealing with and presenting to them is um, has always been organically grown, is um, pure, not mixed with modern wheat or or adulterated in any way, or changed, or modified. There's no GMOs, there's no um, hybrid breeding, or any other kind of breeding, or changing of it. Um, it's also guaranteed to be high protein, and high in minerals, and anyone who uh, uses the trademark, um, according to our trademark license, has to tell the truth about it. <laughs> so we don't want um, hyped up advertising just to um, sell it, we want people to be genuine, and anything they say has to be backed up by research. And um, I first stumbled onto this when I was in high school and saw an old man at the county fair passing out a, um, a handfuls of what he called King Tut's wheat. It was a great novelty around the county and um, we had, I'd heard of it, but I'd never seen it. So I went over to him and, and he poured a handful of it in my, in my hands and, and I was amazed how big it was. It's about three times the size as, reg, as regular wheat. and um, the story was that it had been taken out of a tomb in Egypt by some um, Air Force um, uh, fellows that were on furlough to Egypt and then stationed in Portugal. One of them sent some back to his dad, who is a wheat farmer in, in our county, in Shoto County, Montana, and it grew, um, which should have been the first clue that it didn't come out of a tomb anyway, because nothing, uh, wheat doesn't last for a thousand years in a tomb or anywhere. But um, that's what the story was. It was. Uh, it was just something that was um, fun, and, but no one had any uh, serious um, uh, products or anything that they could figure out what uh, figure out to do with it. So it was after a few years lost lost interest and sort of mostly disappeared. About uh, 14 years later, when I was finishing my PhD at UC Davis, I was reading a back of a package of corn nuts one day that I'd been chewing on, and it said the corn nuts was made with a giant corn. And I thought immediately of this giant wheat and wondered if Cornus would be interested. And when I called them, they said they would. And I called my dad and I asked him to see if we could find some of that old King Tut's wheat. And he found about a pint jar and we sent a few tablespoons of corn nuts and they loved it. And we planted it in the um, garden and then uh, in California in the winter and Montana in the summer, about three years. So we had about 50 pounds. And then we... Um, called Cornus again, but they weren't interested anymore. The guy that I talked to at first was gone and no one was interested. So it sat on the shelf for another five years in our shed and until we went to a food show in California and we found one person out of thousands that walked by our booth, which we were mostly selling high protein wheat and organic wheat and uh, stone ground whole wheat flour from Montana. As we were mostly selling, but my dad was showing everybody this ancient grain. He was there helping with me with my my mother and my um, business partner from Southern California. So there are four of us, and um, my dad's focus was on this ancient grain. He had one one inquiry um, after three days, and so we went home and we planted all 50 pounds and a half an acre. And 30 years later, we had up the 
upwards of over over 200,000 acres spread over over 200 um, organic farmers in Montana, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. And it was, we're sending grain all over the world. And there was really no market for this. It didn't exist. You really helped create it from scratch. Yeah. In, in the beginning, I thought it would just be the novelty of it would be worth, um, oh, 50 or 60 acres on our farm. And I knew if we sold it by the pound, we would be able to recoup a, a good um, return from it. And I had really no visions of it going much further than that until one of our friends who could not eat wheat at all said not only could she eat it, but it made her feel better after she ate it. And she had to send some to her sister in the form of pasta. We were just experimenting with pasta at that point. And um, she not only could eat it, she couldn't eat wheat, and she had lots of other sensitivities to different foods. After a few weeks, she was less sensitive to many other foods that had bothered her. And that, to me, was a huge um, awakening, that this is much more than a novelty. And that's when we started to take it serious and decided to register a trademark to try to protect it so people wouldn't um, adulterate it or mix it with cheaper weed and, and pass it off as um, you know, ancient grain. Um, and, that's, and that's really how it got started. Uh, our first products um, were bread and pasta. And uh, then it went into cold cereal by Arrowhead Mills, and they made a product that went nationwide in just a few months. That was in about 91. And from there, everybody became aware of it and started copying um, the successes that we had seen with, um, with other companies that had been earlier, early adopters. Well, co- contrast Kamut with sort of commodity industrial wheat, the, the kind of wheat that your friend was having a, re, uh, a reaction to. Um, what's the difference um, between Well, that's what things? I wanted to know. <laughs> yeah. And I tried to find some researchers in America that would um, study and compare the two. And I had very little luck 25 years ago. Very few people believed there was a problem with our wheat, our modern wheat. They thought, that, you know, it was um, a wonderful thing that we've increased the yields, increased low volumes, and all these wonderful uh, um, reduction of height. Um, the um, help with uh, being resistant to diseases and even insects. And no one imagined that any of that could have um, had unintended consequences and, and uh, which, which gave people trouble and digestion and, and other problems when they ate the, ate the new wheat. And uh, so we found that some group of scientists in Italy, they were very interested in working with us because they're very interested in knowing the answer to that question there. They believe that there was something to the matter because um, in Italy, the, the food is taken much more seriously than here and people didn't pass off um, trouble eating wheat um, and, and pasta. There were a few of them, uh, not as many in Italy than as there was in America, but they were still significant and it was um, real. And so after oh, a decade or more of research, what we have found that the ancient modern wheat is just a little bit um, causes a little bit of inflammation at different levels and different diseases. We started studying chronic disease because that was hooked to inflammation. And when we found that the ancient wheat was anti-inflammatory, then we started studying diseases. And what we found in comparison is not only the modern wheat has a little more inflammatory properties, but also the ancient wheat has much higher antioxidant capacity. Um, it lowers cholesterol, blood sugar, insulin, insulin resistance. We studied that extensively uh, in, in, um, in diabetics. Uh, we studied heart disease, irritable bowel syndrome, fatty, non-alcoholic fatty liver syndrome, and, and all the results were very, very consistent. Um, increased magnesium and zinc and calcium in the blood, those are all very positive things. And then all these negative things were uh, diminished by eating this ancient wheat. And that's, that's what we've learned so far. It's been quite an amazing trip because no one had described wheat in any form as being anti-inflammatory before. And it's, it's not just what you're growing, it's, it's how you're growing it. Why did you decide to go organic? You were an early adopter in the 1980s in your book, you recall not knowing a single organic farmer in Montana. <laughs> That's right. And people thought you were a little nuts at first. Um, why, why did Absolutely. you go down that path? Well, they thought I'd been in California too long. That's what they thought by neighbors at least. And, um, Although it was about um, six years, I got involved in, in, in buying and selling organic grain um, after we started Montana Flower Grain and trying to market our own crops. 
And then some of our customers wanted organic wheat. And that was my first introduction to organic farmers and organic farming, because as I mentioned, I didn't know anything about it. I, I didn't, I never studied it. I didn't really believe in it. Um, but when I started seeing it in action and meeting farmers that were so enthused about how it was changing their farm lands, uh, landscape and they were growing their own fertilizers and I just felt like I needed to experiment with this. I really was enamored by it. And so my first experiment started in 86 and in two years I had two great successes and um, the second year was a complete failure with the um, um, chemical agriculture. And so by the end of my second year, by the end of 87, I decided to go cold turkey with the whole rest of the farm and, and I haven't looked back nor used any chemical since. And I find it um, a much better way to farm. It, it's economically better. You reduce the cost of your inputs. You increase the value of your outputs. You um, agronomically, it's much better. You increase the, um, li the life in your soil and reduce erosions. And um, I, I eliminated all my inputs. So I grow all my own inputs right on my farm. And I really like that. And I just felt like it was a much better way to farm and a much better way to support the community. We were able to, it takes more management, so we had to hire more people um, because people say, well, it takes more work, but in my mind, that means creates more jobs. And because the grain is of higher value, you're able to support more jobs in rural America. And I think that's very important. So I see all kinds of advantages over the chemical experiment that we're you know, in, the, in the seventh decade of. Yeah, in your, in your book, you ask a really important question um, that I couldn't really improve on. How did 21st century Americans arrive at the most sh short-sighted notion of value in the history of the world? Uh, I'd like, Liz and Bob, can you both take a crack at that one? How did we arrive here? We came to define value as being cheap. You know, like you think of what do we mean colloquially by an extra value meal or a good value? Um, we got to this point where it meant getting a lot of quantity or a lot of volume for for cheap. Um, and, and we traced in the book how, um, you know, that came from this expectation. We got lulled into this expectation that we we weren't going to get paid a lot for our work. And so the things we needed to buy we're going to need to be cheap. And at the same time that we were going to less and less be connected to land, that fewer of us were actually going to farm our own land or raise some of our own food. And we weren't going to get paid a lot for our work. And so value meant getting stuff cheap because we didn't have the money to pay for anything more. So I think the question we're asking in the book is how can we flip that? Um, and first of all, think more about our, our direct connection to land and really celebrate people who are working directly with land. We need more farmers um, in order to have a uh, you know, sustainable food system, but also just sustainability more broadly. So how do we kind of rebuild those connections to land? But then also value should be about uh, you know, people getting a fair value for their work, for farmers getting paid a fair wage, um, you know, the, having enough resources to create those jobs and also do right by the land. And that's the kind of... Um, you know, we want to be thinking about how to grow prosperity and a broad-based prosperity rather than this, this race to the bottom, which has become the way we've thought about value. And I like to um, ask the question wherever I go in talking is uh, why, <clears throat> or not ask the question, make the statement that there is a very high cost for cheap food and it's not paid at the checkout counter. You know, as Liz was talking about, um, it starts to be paid at the farm gate when we're not paying anything for our um, commodities, that's it's a commodity industrial mentality. A lot of farmers don't even think about growing food anymore. They're just focused on commodities and commodity markets um, rather than high quality food. But it, it is squeezing every, trying to do everything they can to squeeze every nickel out of the commodity market to, trip, to, to pay for all the expenses. And then they're not all successful in doing that. I've lost half of my neighbors are gone since when I was growing up. And when you lose that many farmers in small communities, you start to lose a critical mass that supports the businesses within the communities, and many of them start to close and go broke, and it's a vicious cycle. But it extends it on the community when you have effects of, of um, the great and overuse of uh, chemical herbicides and pesticides and fertilizers that now are 
going out and uh, contaminating our environment and polluting our environment. <clears throat> we're we're right now able to test our rainwater and find glyphosate actually in the rain that's coming from who knows where, hundreds of miles away perhaps. But we have so overloaded the environment with with chemical um, pesticides that they are polluting uh, even far away from where they're originally used. And um, the final high cost, of course, is to our health because a lot of um, the food that's being produced at these terrifically abundant but low prices is doesn't have the nutrition that it did formerly. And we have also traces of pesticides on that. And all those things are going into um, a perfect storm, which is causing higher and higher um, chronic disease, uh, just flooding the country. Starting in post-war America, getting farmers off the land was sort of seen as a sign of progress. Uh, but what have you observed in rural communities in Montana and throughout the U.S.? We're not really that nation of small farmers anymore. No, we're not. But I would say now if we could get people out of the cities, it would be a sign of progress um, because the cities are completely overloaded and unable to cope with what they've got. If those, many of those people were back in rural America, they would be much a, better able to cope with um, making a living, with growing more of their own food and supporting their own communities. Um, so I think that we have really gone backwards to the point that it's um, extreme now with, with the idea that um, we have to go to town to get a good job. We have to go to the city to really get um, uh, the services that, that are important. I don't. I think that people's uh, values are starting to change a little bit, and they don't see it quite that way as much anymore. And and you saw the the devastation to your rural community that was wrought by the get big or get out mentality. Um, you saw Big Sandy sort of go from uh, a thriving community to something less than that. And this book is sort of the story of you trying to address that. Well, I think it's kind of just a snapshot on rural America in general. And what I've seen in my community, we, we were a thousand people when I was growing up in the town and now it's 600. That's a 40% drop. That's huge. And uh, it represents a lot of neighbors and a lot of friends and a lot of, of vitality of the community. I mean, it's not dead yet, but it certainly has been diminished. And efforts to stem that are, are, are um welcome and uh, we're trying to do the best we can to to bring people some new people back into the community and and um stem the tide of the outflow in, in this book you lay out kind of a commute manifesto um of sorts talk about the the real measures of economic health and why the economy based on cheapness isn't going to work as we just talked about what what are the measures of real economic vitality well, I would say that one, if you start at the farm level, a measure is farms that are profitable, that don't have to rely on government subsidies, that um, don't have to rely on the farmers going to town to get an extra job or sending their kids and their wife, their wife all to out rather than helping on the farm and being part of the, the whole farm organization, which is the way I was raised. My mother helped uh, was an integral part, and my wife too, of, of the success of our farm. Um, when everybody leaves to, to supplement that, you're really um, putting the farm in, a, in even more of a threat uh, and a high risk. And so I would start right there that that, that would be a, a very positive um, change. And then, of course, as I mentioned before, if the, if the farms are doing better, then the rural communities are going to be doing better. It's just a uh, you keep more money circulating right within the community. And the more that you can do that, the more everybody benefits that's still there. And, and it was kind of interesting to read in the book about sort of your ambivalence, maybe, uh, about exporting some of your product to Italy. Um, but it was it was also interesting to see how that sort of created this new market in that country um, that didn't exist before. Um, so how did you sort of square that uh, international component to your business with sort of the, the great work that you were doing in building a more durable community in Montana? Well, we responded to demands and requests um, for what we were growing. We didn't go out looking for foreign markets. That was not my original business plan at all or what 
was never in my business plan. But my, what was in my business plan is satisfying um, the uh, demand. And I was surprised when we had demand from Europe. I never imagined we would ship grain across oceans and they can grow grain there. But I found that they couldn't grow this particular kind of grain very successfully in Northern Europe particularly. And, there, and that's where we started in Belgium and then Germany became our biggest customer. And then we were told not even to think about going to Italy because it was, the grain was too expensive. This is a, an ancient grain with low yields. We pay the farmers a good price for it. So it makes the end product um, quite expensive relative to modern wheat, which has high yields. And um, we were told, don't even think about going to Italy, but the Italians found it on their own. And they found it made a wonderful pasta. And some of them claimed that it was like a return to something that they used to have and now it was lost and now it's been returned to them. The old timers said, well, this is the way our pasta uh, factories used to smell um, when they made pasta and the way this ancient grain uh, was smelling. The, the one huge advantage of this grain was, and I didn't touch on that earlier, is the, the flavors of it and the texture of it. But it's particularly um, satisfying and enjoyable. And, and because they focused on Italy so much with the enjoyment of food, they latched right onto that. And so we didn't um, discourage it. We didn't encourage it other than try to just satisfy the demand. And the demand was such that we've almost all of our focus was turned toward trying to, um, to meet that. And before we knew it, 75% uh, of our market was in Italy. And um, with that uh, great growth, we were able to bring many more farmers into organic production and provide a market for them and part of their crops. And we were able to have um, returns enough to fund this research that I mentioned earlier. So we had many blessings that re we received from that. But even though it wasn't something we planned to do, um, it was something that evolved and became a very positive thing for us. Talk about the current state of seeds. I, I recently read a book by Dan Barber, who has a blurb on the back of your book uh, called The Third Plate. And in that book, he talks about how we've sort of selected varieties that process well, that store well, that ship well, and we haven't really selected for flavor, for nutrition. Um, and you really sort of started a trend in that direction of, of trying to find heirloom seeds in different varieties that actually will contribute to benefiting humans and their health. And so what can we expect, you know, moving forward and why are heirlooms so important? Well, Ben, I think the, the real key to that understanding is, and you mentioned it, um, is the flavors and the aromas that come from some of these older heirlooms. These are crops that, for the, by and large, have existed for over 10,000 years. And um, what they were focused on was diversity, a couple of things. First of all, for the farmer, diversity meaning that they were mostly land races. They weren't all uh, pure lines, so that when you had insects or diseases come in, by and large, they had different um, resistance to these diseases or insects or whatnot. So if they're attacked by one, it didn't uh, destroy the whole crop, uh, generally. Also, because of diversity, they were also um, uh, had different susceptibilities or resistance to um, very extreme events in the weather. And that is a very important consideration now with climate change because we have, we, you can't predict what we're gonna have. We have most of the extremes in the weather, uh, whether it's too wet or too cold or too hot or too dry, um, uh, or, or hail at the wrong time or whatever. Um, you have, with big diversity of plants, at least you have some normally can withstand um, different attacks better than others. And that is a key to uh, survival and to response to it that I see. But getting back to nutrition, I think the best thing we can do in this country as a driver is to reconnect food and health. And we do that through good nutrition. And um, if through my reach, I wasn't really very tuned into that or, or interested in that until it became obvious from our research that that was the connection. That was why people were having trouble. It was not only that it was, a poor in nutrition, but there are other things that had taken away from uh, the nu nutrition of the um, end product, but also were causing other problems. 
And uh, if you go back to heritage wheat, at least, uh, many of those problems disappeared. And I think that what we've seen and demonstrated with wheat is probably going to be found in almost any crop that has been significantly changed from what our, it was as an heirloom variety and changed just with a focus on high, high yields. And that's the main focus, no matter how you get it, they just want high yields. And normally nutrition is something that um, it's thought that food scientists can take care of by adding um, vitamins and minerals and things that aren't there anymore, they can just be added. But it's not, we're finding it's not the same. Um, and just to add something out of a bottle uh, is not the same as having a plant extracted out of the ground and put it into a form that really um, is suitable for healing and, and promoting the, um, the health and strength of the human body. Liz, talk a little bit about the diversity or lack thereof of what's being planted on industrial farms. Yeah, I mean, I think what Bob said about seeds is right on. And I think, you know, look at our seeds and it tells you a lot about what we value as a society and what we want out of agriculture. And I think, um, you know, if you look at the Midwest, you're going to see mostly corn and soy and not a whole lot of variation um, in what varieties are being planted. And also not, as Bob said, not much genetic variation within those varieties. So these are plants that have been bred to produce a bonanza under very particular controlled conditions with a lot of chemicals um, and sort of just the right environment. And yet they're incredibly vulnerable when they don't have those conditions. And so what we see with climate change is we're having some spectacular failures. Like for example, there was so much rain in the Midwest this season that a lot of farmers couldn't get in and plant their corn. And people were scrambling to figure out another option and another crop, something else to do with their ground because it's gotten so narrowed into that one strategy. So in a way, what we end up with is just this really volatile, unequal situation where you have bonanza on the one hand and failure on the other. And so I think diversity is really the direction to move to um, for more resilience in the face of climate change, for you know, a celebration of different regional cuisines that come out of these different uh, kinds of seeds that have been selected. I mean, we don't have to go that far back in human history. And in many cases, communities have sustained these traditions of selecting seeds with a lot of goals in mind, not just high yield under these chemically saturated conditions, but seeds that really carry within them um, you know, this idea of being resilient to different kinds of climatic events, um, even the idea of being able to sequester carbon and store carbon, understanding that, that plants produce food for us, but they're also part of these larger ecosystems. And then, of course, flavor and nutrition, which are deeply connected. Um, the things we taste when we respond to something um, as having a strong taste, that's often connected to, uh, you know, the chemicals in the plant that are leading to this nutrition and you know things like antioxidants are deeply connected to taste so um, that's part of having a more diverse food system too and really what we can build are these more complete agricultural ecosystems that include people as part of them that are more self-sustaining rather than being um, as monoculture so deeply dependent on ideal climate conditions and all these chemicals and leaving us so vulnerable and leaving so many people left out of getting good nutrition and good livelihoods out of our food system. Well, Liz, talk a little bit about Bob's blueprint for agricultural resilience and also tell us about what else you're seeing out there that gives you hope. Yeah, uh, so I have the greatest job in the world, writing and teaching about regenerative agriculture, organic agriculture, because it is one of the most hopeful things going on in the world. And once you start looking for it, and once you start meeting people and getting connected into these communities, as Bob did in the 80s when he went looking for organic grain for his customer, um, it really gives you a different view of humanity than you would if you were just sort of reading news headlines. Because, um, I mean, any community you go to, there's somebody who's working on a way of growing food that fits within that ecosystem and community in a way that's regenerative and is giving back. Um, so I think what Bob has done in Montana to build these rotations that are not reliant on chemicals and then supply chains that are neither reliant on the chemicals uh, nor on the large multinational 
corporations that are involved in processing and retail to really create a whole ecosystem both in the soil and the farm, but also among people that's really about um, a, a sort of shared value and a circulation of value um, that just keeps cycling in a way that benefits all of the members. Um, and I think you see that in other places too. Um, I was just traveling uh, to David Vetter's farm in Nebraska, who was uh, a mentor of Bob's. We were both there recently. Um, he's done a similar thing in a rural community in Nebraska, built this um, rotation, this nine-year rotation. Bob also has a nine-year rotation that doesn't require any external inputs, uh, built a processing facility so that organic farmers around him have a, a value-added market they can sell into rather than the commodity market. And you literally see this all over the world. You know, you see small coffee farmers in Central America who are growing coffee in the context of complete agricultural ecosystems, including some native rainforest, finding value-added markets for that, and there's these partnerships with and not consumers, I don't want to use that word, really with food citizens who want to be part of that kind of ecosystem. You see it everywhere. Um, and so I think, um, you know, wherever you are, um, you know, folks listening to this, whether you are, uh, you know, a producer in this ecosystem, you know, go for it right on. You are one of my greatest heroes. And if you're not a producer, um, you know, Bob and I talk about this a lot. Everybody's a food citizen. Everybody is a co-producer. Eating is an agricultural act, as Wendell Berry said. So anywhere you are, you can find the people in your region who are trying to build these kind of regenerative ecosystems around food and the people in food. And there's so many ways, you know, from just, you know, <laughs> adding one item when you go grocery shopping, you're going to the farmer's market, um, to joining a community-supported agriculture. There's so many ways to, as an eater yourself, become part of that ecosystem. You mentioned Wendell Berry and, you know, Bob, I'm curious to know who some of your biggest influences have been during your agricultural journey. Um, I do hear echoes of Wendell Berry when I hear you talk about creating these durable local economies, but who, who are some other people who've been instrumental in your formation as, as, a, as a farmer? Well, I think that my three biggest mentors were um, closely uh, very studious of Wendell Berry, so I'm getting it almost, um, I'm getting a second hand, I guess you'd say. But Dave Better, that uh, Liz already mentioned, um, the grain place in Nebraska, was a very big mentor and helper of mine. Fred Kirschman in North Dakota um, helped me with um, organic ideas on the, on the Northern Great Plains. And Tom Harding in Pennsylvania uh, was uh, the first one who came to my farm t in 87 to um, certify the first 20 acres that was organic and uh, was a great mentor of of the uh, organic movement more than just agriculture in addition to agriculture but also the organic movement throughout America but also in the whole world. And, and your father's also featured prominently in the book as, as a supporter. Oh yes well that yeah but I, I didn't think my father is so much a mentor as, as a father figure <laughs> and a partner in, in the farm. He was raised here. Um, he raised me here um, I also grew up uh, very much under the tutelage of my grandfather, who started the farm in 1920. So we had, I had two generations really mentoring me uh, day to day uh, about farming and, and, and life in general. Liz, what, what is your story? How did you become so connected and passionate about agriculture? Well, you know, my family, we lost our farm in the Dust Bowl. Um, and so I think it was my grandmother's stories about those experiences, both what she really loved about an agrarian life as a child, and then just the tragedy of that loss that she saw as really rooted in this, this failure to understand soil health and this prioritization of, you know, exporting the value away <laughs> to faraway grain markets rather than really regenerating that land and that community. So I think it was that seed was planted um, by my grandmother that I would really like to be involved in in regenerating what was broken in her time when my family was connected to our own land. And then I was just really fortunate. I, I spent this time as a country singer, you know, sort of telling the story of rural America with this idea that, you know, stories could sort of revitalize. Um, I think what I saw at the time is 
Jeffersonian agrarian democracy. And then, you know, hearing from farmers about the real struggles in the way that the agricultural economy is structured and the way policies constrain that economy and help shape that economy. And while I was thinking about all that, John Tester, you know, this organic farmer from Montana runs for the Senate, talking about how to build a green economy and, and regenerative agriculture that doesn't have all the value flowing through those large corporations and doesn't send all of the nutrients away, but actually regenerates the, the ecological value as well as, you know, keeping those dollars within communities. And, and from there, it's just been, um, you know, making friends um, and really having the privilege to, to walk among uh, people who I think, I think we will look back a um, hundred years from now and say, you know, wow, the people who pioneered organic farming in this country and really called for us to move in that direction, who started experimenting with those systems in the 70s and 80s and listening to traditional farmers around the world who have been farming in that way for all of human history and saying, you know what, industrial quote unquote modern agriculture is not the right direction, it's not progress. Um, I think we will look back um, and we will thank these people over and over because it's going to be critical to our response to climate change. It's going to be critical to, you know, building a healthier economy and it's going to be critical to, uh, you know, better health and nutrition as well. I mean, industrial chemical agriculture seems so entrenched, but when I listen to you talk, I, I can't help but get sort of optimistic and inspired uh, by what you're saying, do you feel that th that the current sort of paradigm structure is is on the wane? I think we're we're definitely at a moment of potential transformative change, and I think there's a few reasons for that. I do think that we're seeing the impacts of climate change um, very clearly. It's having impacts that are super destructive in terms of um, the economies of, you know, major regions in our country, um, as well as, you know, serious danger to people's lives. And I think that is driving a lot of interest in how agriculture can be part of the solution. And it is really important, um, this idea of sequestering carbon in soils and also reducing emissions that come from agriculture and making sure our agriculture is more resilient to the climate changes we're already seeing. So I think that's driving a little bit more change. I think these health issues are definitely driving more change. Um, and I think you see it reflected in policy. Um, you know, our campaign season starts really early in this country, so we're already having a lot of discussions about, you know, the 2020 presidential elections. And there is so much discussion of these very policy issues in ways that I have not seen at that level before, um, that, that so many people in the Democratic primary race feel they have to have a policy position on what to do about um, industrial chemical agriculture and these monopolies in Monsanto. Um, you know, that, that's the first time I think that it's come up so early as such an important issue in a presidential campaign. And I think that reflects that this is, this is not a down the list issue for people. People see this as, uh, you know, something, it's a synergistic way to address challenges with healthcare, challenges with climate change, challenges with rural economies by aligning our food system with value in all those areas rather than continuing to extract from all those areas in order to just make more profit for a handful of corporations. So I think it's a really hopeful time. I think so many more people are aware of these issues and thinking about them when they make everyday choices. And um, so, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm fired up. I'm, I'm excited to be doing this work. Well, right. I mean, during every you know election season, there's a lot of lip service paid to rural America and working class people. Um, but you're right. I have heard talk about agriculture in a way that I haven't heard before. Are there particular policies that you're hearing floated that are particularly uh, promising to you? Well, people are talking about antitrust in the agricultural sector. And that, in a way, is maybe, you know, so, you know, Iowa is really important in the presidential election cycle. So I think you do hear agriculture talked about. But normally, I think what I've seen is that candidates have really been deferential to the powers that be, which is to say the Iowa Farm Bureau. 
And while they may say kind of flowery things about supporting the American farmer, when it comes to policy, what they're doing is courting the support of the power players that already exist in Iowa and rural America, which are, um, you know, the financial backing behind these powerful agrochemical corporations, um, you know, the processors. It, it's that whole world that candidates are aligning themselves with. This time around, I think you see more people actually stepping up with policy proposals to enforce, you know, existing antitrust protections and maybe deepen those and say, you know, basically our food system doesn't exist for Monsanto's benefit or Bayer's benefit. Um, there is a limit to how much we're going to allow people to monopolize certain sectors of our food system because it's a danger to uh, you know, the economy to our ability to, you know, shape these things around what's actually good for people in the environment. So that I think is a big difference is you see people aligning themselves more really with farmers interests rather than with the interests of these powerful agrochemical corporations. And one of the things that I'm really uh, optimistic about, Ben, was what happened in the last farm bill, or farm bill. Um, and, of course, and this came out of Republican administration now, so we're starting to see a little movement on both sides, which I think is really exciting because we've had the problems were created for, by both sides. So we have to have a general awakening in the whole country that um, we need to examine a different direction. And where I saw that play out best is in the uh, appropriations or the, the amount of money that was um, earmarked for organic research in the last farm bill went from 20 to 50 million dollars which is still way below the um, percent of the the money being spent on organic research it is still around one percent and that in the um, the sales of organic food is is over six so there's still a big disparity but when you more than double it in one jump that's if we could do that every farm bill for a couple cycles, then we start to bring some of these things back in balance. Because one of the things really, I think most discouraging the farmers to change away from chemicals is really to understand and know how to do it and, and have advisors in the form of county agents and have research that can um, help them deal with weed problems and some of these things that are troublesome in organic systems. And I think research and, and the commitment of the federal government in this way is very, very critical and important to us. Why did you write this book? What did you hope to accomplish? I hope to share the um, enthusiasm and the, uh, some of the success of what I have experienced on my farm and my community with other farmers and other communities and also give those that aren't farmers and, and, and living in big communities and big cities, a reason to really support us and support us um, by changing the way they shop and the way they buy their food and also to help them um, with increasing their health. I think that it's, it's a really a, a broad base um, number of reasons that I had in mind, but um, it was really starting with wanting to share with my neighbors in a way that laid it all out um, over three decades of, of experience and trying to show that there's a better way to go than, than down the um, industrial chemical road of agriculture that we thought was going to solve all of our problems in the past. And, and, that, and that's really sort of the goal is to get people to be food citizens and not consumers. Um, you know, I think as you detail in the book, uh, people spend right. far, far less of their income on food you know it's a much smaller percentage than what it used to be but do you think people are sort of waking up to the fact that uh they're paying for that those cheap commodity goods down the road with bad health well, certainly the ones that are sick are um they're, they're very much aware of that <clears throat> and, and the ones that have sensitivities to wheat and, and all other kinds of problems and but this um, problem with chronic disease um it's not only food but food is such a important linchpin in it. And to understand that, I think it's going to be an enormous driver in change. And more and more people are starting to understand that as they're not being able to be cured by more and fancier drugs. Um, we are not addressing the cause. We're only addressing many times the symptoms of disease. And this is um, not the, the right answer. I mean, it's, a, it's certainly a help, but it's not a solution. And that's, we really are reaching the point now where we start, 
we need to focus on solutions. Okay. So if you were, let's say, Secretary of Agriculture for the U.S. and at the same time, the Surgeon General, what would be your first action? Well, I, when I go back to Washington, I, you know, there's a lot of debate on um, what kind of healthcare system is best for the country. And it's a question I always like to ask them. I said, why are you debating over or fighting over what kind of healthcare system is best? And I think the question that you ought to be asking is why are so many people sick? And if we ask that question, both from the standpoint of the Department of Agriculture and also from Institutes of Health and, and everything to do with, with um, that aspect of, of government um, work and bureaucracy, and they working together, I think we could um, come to the conclusion and the solution of that, the answer to that question quite quickly. And once we have the answer, then hopefully there would be the resolve to do something about it. So those, those kind of combinations, in my mind, are just a natural um, opportunity for solutions. And even though they work so much in isolation, it's really time to work together with food and health. Liz, do you want to expand on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing I would do, just to get really specific, is um, make the Good Food Purchasing Program national policy. So this is a, a set of standards for public procurement of food, which is mostly served to kids in schools. And um, you know, a number of cities have adopted these standards. So Los Angeles, Chicago, Philadelphia, there's a number of cities around the country. But if we as a nation said that we are gonna take the, the food that we're purchasing in our public systems, and we're gonna ensure that we utilize those dollars to support sustainable farming, regional economies, but also make sure that, that every kid has a nutritious meal, that would do so much to help jumpstart these economies around just the kind of work that Bob is doing and so many other folks are doing, um, you know, and building a totally different kind of supply chain as well as a different kind of, um, you know, rotational farm rather than chemically supported. Um, and I think that's the perfect example of a synergy between healthcare policy and agricultural policy where both sides win <laughs> rather than, yeah. you know, kids being hungry and farmers not making enough money or having stable markets. And the only thing I would add to that is that I would provide um, opportunities for those kids to raise some of their own food in school gardens and have them uh, give them an opportunity to work in the kitchen where they can help prepare those foods and clean up um, after those that enjoy those foods and, and, and see how that, learn from their own effort and their own involvement of how important that all is. And where that has been done, you have an amazing a change in, in kids' attitude about what they eat. Um, their pickiness of what they eat changes completely. Um, and I think that's where we start. We start with the youth. We start with the, the rising generation and get them involved in ways that they may not be able to do their whole life, of course, but at least they have an understanding that so many do not have now. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Um... And I think, you know, we've seen that even with our educational farm at Stanford University um, is right. tremendously um, for, for the college kids and also for the fifth graders who come on field trips that the college kids teach. Um, like Bob said, it changes how you think about what you eat. There's a lot of studies showing that kids are much more likely to be interested in eating their vegetables if they actually grew them. Uh, so there's a strategy right there. And it's happening right now, but certainly if, uh, if you had somebody who was uh, <laughs> simultaneously Surgeon General and Secretary of Agriculture who said, school gardens for all, um, and that, would, <laughs> that would be a help to, uh, you know, everybody who's doing that work. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree. And I, I've often wondered, people always say, you know, if you want kids to eat their vegetables, ha help have them involved in growing them. And it'd be interesting to see if like you could have the opposite effect if you like had a kid like actually make a Big Mac or something like that, see if they would stop eating it, you know, after they see what the process is might, might. Well, like, yeah, another, or take, them to, the, take them to the slaughter plant where they exactly. make yeah. the hot dogs and see how that process goes right, and exactly. see how many hot dogs they want to eat after that. Because um, even before you get to the, the restaurant, our processing really needs to be looked at and, and um, examined. And there's better ways we could do that too. The other thing I would like to see, Ben, if we had the, the chance to work here at the Agriculture Department and, and uh, Surgeon General and those folks is to come up with a, 
uh, nutritional index that we can put right on the label of our food. So when people see uh, at the grocery store how much they're paying for nutrition, maybe it would give them a little more incentive to um, pay a little more for nutrition and not so much for Twinkies and, and sodas, the kind of thing that Liz was just talking about. If people could see that in front of them immediately upon uh, before they purchase it, I think that would dr be also help to drive things in the right direction. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Where are, you, where are you two going next with this book? I mean, it's a real conversation piece. How are you getting the word out? Well, we're, I'm heading to California tomorrow, to, and we'll be joining up um, on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. at, um, at, uh, just right near uh, Liz's back, back door, actually. So, Liz, why don't you tell a little bit about that? That's the next step, and then we're still on our book tour for another nine months. Uh, we're right. going to, all around the country in, in, in schools, uh, universities, bookstores, um, companies everywhere um, we can find an audience that has an interest and uh, we're loving it <laughs> I mean great right. yeah you, you would imagine that two people who believe in uh, diverse crops and diverse agricultural markets also believe in a very diverse book tour so mm -hmm. um, we were just in uh, Aurora Nebraska um, and and really talking with a lot of folks who are on the front lines of of the commodity food system as agricultural producers and many of them trying to shift their farms and, and get into non-commodity markets. And uh, this week we're gonna be at a, a Silicon Valley food festival called Hacking Food uh, with a completely different crowd of people um, who are mostly entrepreneurs and investors who are trying to figure out ways to develop business models that incentivize sustainable food systems and sustainable farming systems. And I think, um, you know, getting to talk to, to different folks who connect for different reasons and hopefully kind of put them in better connection with each other um, so that there's more collaboration across the food system, that would be a great outcome, I think, from these travels. And that reminds me, Bob, you talk in the book a little bit about how certain terms like organic or sustainable can become devalued and, and, and appropriated to where they sort of lose their punch and their impact. What, how are your thoughts evolving on that? Are you seeing um, sort of the same story play out again, or you know, particularly with regenerative is, is the term that I'm hearing a lot now. You know, how, how do you sort of combat that? How do you give people the proper context to understand what these terms mean and why they're important? Well, I think the, <clears throat> the best thing we can do is just further education on this. And in my mind, and you have so many different definitions for regenerative now, it's, it's, it's in danger of being a little bit like natural, but if we um, finally or more def strictly define it as uh, regenerative organic, I like to put those two together because organic that is not regenerative is just as incomplete as regenerative that's not organic. Uh, either way, we're, we don't go clear to the finish line and, and have something as good as we could get. Um, I think that a lot of times you can certainly, if you follow the rules, um, the government rules of organic, you can have systems that really n are not regenerative. If you follow the spirit of organic and how it was visualized from the very beginning, uh, certainly um, regenerative was a, a, a basic component, um, but that was a little harder to put into law. Um, and uh, with, with some of the debates and some of the things I've seen with regenerative who, by people who are focusing only on uh, no-till and using chemicals to accomplish that, particularly glyphosate and Roundup and those sort of, of things. Mm -hmm. I think that it, when they talk about cover crops, they're certainly going the right direction and making a lot of progress, but I encourage them not to stop along the road to, um, a, uh, to, to really a better uh, end that they could achieve if they could um, eliminate all those chemicals and, and um, really rely on natural um, sort of cycles and and uh, natural inputs and not be poisoning our our environment in any shape or form well thanks so much to both of you for taking time to talk with me i really appreciate it is there anything i didn't ask or that you wanted to share uh one thing that that didn't come up and that always gravels me is um the charge that uh is laid at the two charges laid at the feet of organic, uh, the organic movement. One is that they're gonna, half the world will starve if we 
all are organic. And the other is that this is only food for elitist rich people. And um, I always like to um, comment on those because I hear them so much from, from our detractors. And the first one is fairly easy to rebut by research done in, in uh, <clears throat> studying peasant farms or small farms that feed two thirds of the world's population in Asia. And, and if you add Africa, it's up to three quarters. Um, research coming out of Africa and India has demonstrated that those peasant farms, if converted to regenerative organic agriculture, would increase their yields by two or three times. Um, that would do a lot to um, um, stave off hunger for I mean, decades, hundreds of years, even with the current population growth. But the other thing that is not having anything to do with organic or non or chemical agriculture is food waste. We waste all over the world 40 to 50 percent of our food. That also is a, a available resource that's, that's being lost and could be addressed. And there's starting to be more discussion on that. And as far as, oh, and then I should say also in, in the developed countries where you have chemical agriculture um, studies at Rodale, for example, and our own experience on our farm, we find that um, after a um, transition period where the, the organic systems are stabilized, that the yields are pretty close to average of the county yields. Um, in very wet years for us, they're, they're falling behind. And in average years for rainfall, we're about the same. And in very dry years, we exceed the county averages by a significant amount because the, the grain is being, and other crops are being burned up by excess of fertilizer and, and lack of water, lack of rain. Mm -hmm. So that's the other thing for the um, industrial world. We have increased our yields, but Organic can do the same thing if it is done properly in a regenerative way. Um, as far as feeding, or as far as everybody being able to afford food, it certainly is more expensive, and we don't apologize for that because the farmers have to have a living, and and so do the people that are working in the food industries all along the the uh, system are some of the lowest paid in in the whole country, and why shouldn't they have a fair wage too and have a real cost? added to the food. But yet we have people who cannot afford a lot of processed food, that's for sure. I mean, they can't afford to buy frozen dinners and everything all prepared, go out to the restaurants as often as some others do and eat organic. Um, but they can go to their local food markets or farmers markets and even to their organic uh, food stores, join co-ops and whatnot, and get basic um, uh, produce and grains and seeds right off the farm or out of um, bulk bins um, in season for vegetables, but bulk bins for grains out of their food stores and then take those home and prepare them. Um, they, that's something that they could do to eat on a budget that's no different than what they're spending on, on um, commercial um, uh, food, that processed food, highly processed food, just by spending a little bit more for raw materials and, and cooking it and, and eating it that way themselves, which is a lot better way to go. Okay, there you have it. Thanks to Bob and Liz for joining us today. And seriously, go buy the book. It's published by Island Press, and it's available at the Acres USA online bookstore, acresusa.com. I also want to say thank you to our sponsors, BCS America. And I also wanted to point out to you, the listener, that Tractor Time is brought to you by Acres USA. Acres has been dedicated to the mission of educating growers and non-growers about the benefits of ecological farming practices for more than 40 years. At Acres, our content's designed to help you drive your operation, big or small, in an economical and ecological way. Our products, from books to a monthly magazine to annual events to podcasts and newsletters, are filled with high-quality content produced by farmers, consultants, and researchers. Wherever you are in your farming journey, we're here to help you. Visit acresusa.com, ecofarmingdaily.com, or find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Email us at info at acresusa.com or call 1-800-355-5313. Acres USA, the voice of eco-agriculture.